great. Um, yeah, I'm thrilled to finally be here to give this talk in person. It took me a while. Um, I'm thrilled to tell you about some of the mathematics I've been interested in recently. And this has to do uh, with systolic inequalities. So this picture uh, depicts a torus, two-dimensional torus with a remaining metric, perhaps, so that you can measure lengths, you can measure its area. And whenever I'm talking about systols, I mean something like this, like this orange curve, which is a shortest non-contractible loop on my surface. I will define it in a second, but that's the picture you might have in your mind. And this finger is just supposed to represent that the surface doesn't have to be so it has a metric, and the metric doesn't have to be standard in any way. Um, all right, so that's there's the informal definition of the systole. Systole is the shortest topological non-trivial closed curve, uh, or more precisely, the length of the shortest topological non-trivial closed curve on my surface, or more generally, manifold. You might think about n-dimensional or manifold. So there are two non-equivalent ways of precisely saying topologically non-trivial, uh, specifying what that means. So one of them is like when you have, whenever you have a loop that you can you cannot continuously deform to a point, or uh, whenever your loop does not bound the surface with boundary. Yeah. Uh, so they are not equivalent, and moreover, whenever you are in the like, so th this is so to speak homotopical case, this is, so to speak homological case, and in the homological case, you can consider different coefficients of your homology, and it will give you different equations. This will be all different invariants of your metric space. Remaining the same. So more generally, yeah. So the term. Uh, goes back to Marcel Berger, and yeah, it, it, it refers to the word Latin word contraction, and it was used in biology before. In biology, apparently, they call it systole. Uh, and yeah, but it, it, it appeared in the work of Lovner and his student earlier. Uh, and the like, there's a model example of a systolic inequality that we'll be interested in. So it says that the length of the shortest not contractible loop on the surface is, can be bounded in terms of the area. Yeah. So here it doesn't matter for the, for the torus, for example, it doesn't matter which definition of the system you use. So they proved it for the two-dimensional torus and for the two-dimensional projective. Right, so the next- For any metric on them? Or for, for any metric, yeah. Actually, they came up with sharp constants here, but I'm not interested in sharp constants. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the next non-trivial case is like genus G surface or maybe higher dimensional manifold, remaining manifolds. And perhaps the most influential uh, result in the area is the realm of systolic inequality from 93, from 83. Uh, it says that, so if we consider the moment of a systole, which is the length of the shortest non-contractible loop in my Riemannian n-dimensional manifold, then, uh, it can be bounded uh, from above in terms of the uh, root of the volume and is the dimension. Assuming that your manifold satisfies a certain topological assumption, which is called essential. I'll describe it in a second, but let me emphasize that the, the assumption on the manifold is topological, but the inequality itself has to do with metrics. So, this should be. <laughs> That's a cool thing about this inequality that for any remaining metric, as long as you have manifolds of specimen topological assumption, you have this historic inequality. So essential here means that, well, this rigorous definition says that the classifying map, which is defined up to homotopy of the like from your manifold to the classifying space, Allenberg McLean space of the fundamental group, cannot be deformed to the n minus one dimensional scalar of that space. But I don't want you to think about this rigorous definition. And the informal way of thinking of this definition was uh, proposed by uh, the same Marcel Berger. And uh, 
like informally, he says, this can be thought of as uh, the following condition that non-contractible curves, uh, loops on your manifold, they fill your manifold in every direction. So a model example to keep in mind of a non-essential manifold is uh, as follows, as one crosses two. And for this manifold, you can come up with a Riemannian metric so that the systolic inequality does not hold. So, and namely, you can just take like super long S1, very long circle, and multiply it by a very small round sphere. And uh, the non the non conductible curves in this manifold they only wrap around this S1 direction, but they don't fill your manifold in the direction of S2, informally speaking. And yeah, you can see that this is still is a Fourier R and it's not bounded by the. Um, yeah, apparently somewhere between the lines of Roma's work, you can find the homology version of the same inequality where you uh, bound the bigger quantity. So if I consider the homology system, uh, it's, it's, it can be in general bigger than the, uh, the homotopy system. So it still can be bounded by the root of the volume if you replace the assumption by something pretty much the same, but with the homotopy group replaced by the homology group, first homology group. Any coefficients? Well, any, any coefficients, yes. Um, yeah, but yes, let me define it rigorously. So uh, the key dimensional homology system is defined as the infimal key dimensional volume of a cycle, or you can think of a submanifold if you are not familiar with the cycle, uh, non trivial in the corresponding homology. And again, you can take different, co different coefficients and you'll get different results, different numbers. Um, yeah, at this point. So if you require manifold instead of circle, it looks stronger, but it's both are true. Uh, I don't think it's true over Z, to be honest, but that's what my like informal picture. But yeah. All right, here is a strengthening of the previous report. Again, I'm I'm it's not the strength thing in the sense that I'm making my assumptions stronger and then the, the result is stronger as well. So if I replace the homology essential assumption by something like this, so there are, assume there are uh, homology classes, first homology classes, N of them, so, so, uh, such that their product, their cup product is non zero in the top homology of my N dimensional manifold, then this implies the homology essential assumption from the previous slide. So this is still stronger. Assumption the manifold. But then the conclusion is stronger as well. So here you, you can bound not just the shortest system in a sense, but you can, like, once you've chosen those classes, you can uh, measure the length of loop detected <laughs> by each of those homology classes. Uh, when I say loop detected by homology class, I mean that you just evaluate your homology class on the loop and you get non zero. So for each homology class, you can compute the restricted system. It will be bigger than, well, in general, it will be bigger than the, just the homology system. And you have this bound for the product. Yeah, and the name Minkowski principle metaphorically refers to the second Minkowski inequality about uh, on this body containing lattice points. It, it, it's true for the for Finsler manifolds and for flat, flat Finsler Tory, it's approximately the same as the Minkowski second theorem, but this is not true. That's the explanation of the name. So detected by alpha just means that it is in the homology of M, it is exactly alpha one class. Uh, so uh, uh, like alpha, is, alpha is co-homology. So oh, okay. uh, oh, I, oh, I minimize over the loops uh, such that oh, uh, okay. I can like, I evaluate alpha on those loops and get non zero. Oh, okay. So it was actually a hope of Groma from early 90s uh, to, to have some kind of implication where the relation in uh, the, some kind of non-triviality in cut products uh, would imply maybe, he thought, some kind of systolic inequality like this. 
So this is one of the manifestations where this is actually true. But let's ask the same question for non-essential molecules. So for example, say S1 cross S2 or S1 cross S3, so buffet, which is non-essential. So none of the theorems before implies. Uh, is it true that the first homology system multiplied by the co-dimension one homology system still can be bounded by the volume? Or more generally, if you have some uh, non-trivial cup product in some, uh, for, for some cohomology classes, not necessarily first cohomology, does that imply that the corresponding product of the, the higher dimensional, not one dimensional systems, maybe higher dimensional system still bounded by the volume? That's a question, great question. I didn't specify the coefficient so far, but we will soon see that this is not relevant because the answer, okay, first of all, the answer is no with Z coefficients. And I think I'll skip through with the example, like just in two words, the example on S1 cross S3 is constructed that you start from usual round metric on S3, you multiply it by the interval, and then you glue top to the bottom using some carefully chosen map, self map of the self isometry of S3. And the resulting manifold turns out to be the inequality above. Uh, but the same example, it turns out that it doesn't work for with more two coefficients because of this uh, co dimension one system. You can, like, informally, you can think that the co dimension one system is like the minimal volume of some submanifold which can be either oriented or not necessarily oriented depending on the coefficients. So this makes a difference and the system is different in different cases. So the same example does not work with Z mod two coefficients, but uh, the answer is still no with for some much more complicated uh, examples that Mike Friedman found, even with multi coefficients. And those examples have to do with some arithmetic hyperbolic surfaces for which you also start from the same construction, multiply by the interval, glue top to the bottom, and then do some soldiers. In these negatively closed situations, don't you get much better bounds? Uh, better so than what? Then just volume, you would get no, 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 no. It's still not true. So the, the inequality is, is still not true. So now in negatively curved, yes. Said, so he makes an example of an arithmetic negatively curved yes. surface where yes, yes, yes. So the first system will be like low G where yeah, right. the surface, that's... this is the genus of the surface. But the, the code I mentioned once is okay. Like, so I was just saying that the first system will drop to log, right? Yes, yes, yes. But the code I mentioned one is the cheaper one. Okay. So that you cannot bound the product in terms of the volume. Well, you can, but not just by the constant times the volume. Right. So he came up with metrics on this one process two with the like huge systolic product much bigger than the volume. And this is called the phenomenon of systolic freedom mod two. And one way to measure the extent of the systolic freedom is as follows. So th this kind of inequality is not homogeneous. So we do like whenever you scale your manifolds, the different the uh, different sides grow, different rates. So one way to measure the extent of this solid freedom is to scale your manifold first if needed to make it uh, local geometry bounded, so to speak. So to make it injectivity radius uh, bigger than one and make it sectional curvature less than one, and then. Maybe we can come up with some estimate. We can measure the systolic product in terms of some function of the volume, which is bigger than the volume. So I multiply volume, but by some monotone, monotone increasing function of, of, of the volume. And for example, if we if we would get so if you, for if you for for your family for your favorite family of examples, you get f approximately constant. That means you have a systolic inequality or systolic rigidity. No systolic freedom. But in Friedman's example, you have uh, root of log g, root of log uh, additional factor. So here's the main theorem that I would like to talk about. So it basically says that Friedman's example are almost as free as possible. 
basically it says that, yeah, well, here is the rigorous formulation. Any Riemannian manifold with bounded local geometry. And uh, as long as it has those systems finite, which is the same to say it has non trivial for homology, as long as it has finite systems, uh, the product uh, can, can be uh, founded from above in terms of the volume, just by epsilon can be chosen up to right? Yes, yes, any epsilon, but the constant depends on. So that's the cool result, which doesn't hold with the Z coefficient, for example. And it's cool because it actually it's true in my greater generality, it's true for in the discrete context, it's true for any simplicial complex without actually assuming that your space is a manifold. But let me not go into these details. And to finish, let me just uh, say what happens for uh, other systolic products. So we don't know what happens for the product of the second and n minus uh, two systole. We don't know what happens in this case, but we do know that this phenomenon uh, of like being almost rigid systolically is, is no longer true in dimension four in a dimension four, because there are some very fun examples by Friedman and Hastings of manifolds which come through quantum error correcting codes. <laughs> they started from quantum error correcting codes and they built manifolds out of that. <laughs> and this is, that, that's cool. Yeah, I'll stop here. In connection with the codes, didn't uh, <laughs> and Bobotsky make some examples with hyperbolic manifolds? Um, maybe I, I think that's the only example of these like systolic freedom apart from the original Freeman's examples that I know about. I would be curious. I'll show you. Okay. So when you when you say it's um when I mean you you, you mentioned it's false with Z coefficients. I mean do do you mean it's not known or can you do can uh, so you do counted examples? Apparently, with z coefficients, you can do arbitrary. You can have arbitrarily large rate of growth on the right hand side, and apparently, ah. this is no. So you can arbitrary. You can have arbitrary power. It's. I think you can even have an exponent. So it's it's just it's crazy. It cannot happen with z minus two coefficients, though. I didn't explain that, but uh, in fact, you cannot have anything. Worse than volume square here in the right hand side. It with more two coefficients. Oh, two coefficients. Yes, but with z you you might have systems. So you might think so. Around. Around. Yeah. Crazy. Okay. Um, in the uh, inequality one, <coughs> you keep epsilon fixed. Uh, how does c and epsilon <laughs> depend on m? Can you control that? Uh, usually, like usually, people are not particularly interested as far as there is a dimensional constant. So I well, the original come up as a sort of inequality we could, we, we do yeah, yeah, yeah. yes 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 it can, yeah. be, yeah. it can be linear. So I, I I'll need to think about it. I never thought about it. Mm -hmm. So I in the proof <laughs> I don't care about it, but it's and so then so I don't think it's it's any good. But the, the proof is pretty much the same as the one that gives the currently known currently the best currently known bounds for the usual system. So, so hence maybe you can control it. I think so. So maybe it's linear and end here. Mm -hmm. think, sorry, not linear and, and to the end. In Leibniz's work, uh, did, did he, uh, the the term you, you mentioned this very quickly. You said Leibniz determined the constant. Did yes, they get the extremal metric. Yes, yes. So in the torus, it's like the equilateral. Oh, like you, no, you, you, you take two yeah. lot of triangles. Yeah. So in the fourth example, the counter example, what kind of these manifolds are in the limits? Oh, it's a very special manifold. Yes, this is hard to explain. I have I was, I have no intuition behind those manifolds, what how those manifolds look like, but they're they're glued in, in certain like cellular-ish type of way, and so that they're the chain complex. 
reflects the structure of a very complicated uh, quantum code, which is also a chain, chain complex. And the chain, the chain complex itself is very expander ish behavior. So it, it should be somehow encoded in those manifolds as well. But apart from that, I cannot say anything. There are no other questions. Let's thank you again.